we are delighted to introduce Queens of Jerusalem, the women who dared to rule. This session is presented by Rajasthan Patrika. Of the numerous books written on the history of crusades, the stories of women and their place in the religious wars that defined centuries remain largely unchronicled. Medieval historian Catherine Pangonis' debut book, Queens of Jerusalem, explores the trailblazing women of the Crusades who were not passive transmitters of land and blood, but formidable leaders with political agency and aspirations, integral to diplomacy, military strategy, and even rebellion. In conversation with Ira Mukoti, Pangonis discusses the women that forged world history. Catherine is a historian specializing in medieval world of the Mediterranean and Middle East. She has a master's degree in literature and history from Oxford University and University College London. Catherine is particularly interested in rewriting women's voices into historical narratives and re-examining the understudied studied areas of history. Please also welcome Ira Mukoti. Ira is the author of Akbar, the Great Mughal, Daughters of the Sun, Empresses, Queens, and Begums of the Mughal Empire, and heroines, powerful Indian women in myth and history. She writes rigorously researched narrative histories that are accessible to everyone. Her debut novel, Song of Draupadi, was published in 2021. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to JLF. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I want to tell all of you, do not be scared by words like medieval and scholar. This is an absolutely wonderful, readable, accessible book and so entertaining. I wasn't able to put it down. Um, so, Catherine, I would like to begin with um, just, you know, for our, our listeners here who might not be entirely knowledgeable about this period. So we're talking about, uh, of course, Jerusalem, but also all the area around it in the 12th century. And, you know, this was the time when the Pope Urban II, I think, decided to call uh, for the first crusade and Christianity goes from the, being this religion of peace and tolerance and humility to one of armed uh, sort of violence, uh, you know, in, uh, in quest of a greater, uh, you know, Christian community. So it changes entirely. The world changes very much, especially in this area. So can you set the stage for us a little bit? Who were the primary actors? What was happening in this area? Because they weren't just the Christians arriving from a different place. There were the local Jews and Muslims and the Armenians. Uh, and this was this complex society, uh, you know. So can you tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the place, what was happening, and also the phraseology? You use the word Utremer, beyond the seas, to talk about it, uh, as opposed to the Levant and other terms. So can you tell us a little bit about this? Yes, of course. So as Ira's very aptly said, this was not just a case of European Christians coming over to an area um this yeah this was not just a case of only christian crusaders coming over to the levant when they did when they did arrive on these armed pilgrimages that have become known in centuries later as the crusades the communities and cult and the the cultures the cities they found there were incredibly diverse and multicultural so we have evidence of you know travelers from as far as iceland and indeed india in jerusalem at this time and you have many different ethnic groups religious groups and communities existing within the latin east at this time so within Jerusalem alone, I mean, even within just Christianity, you have Armenian, Christian, Armenian Christians, Maronite Christians, Syriacs, many different, and Maronites, of course, many different creeds, many different branches of Christianity represented in the East at this time, alongside, of course, very diverse Jewish communities, and of course, the different Islamic communities. So many different groups are represented at this time. And the Crusaders, once they had captured these lands by the sword, I mean, and the Crusades, it cannot be overstated how egregiously violent they were. These were massacres took place in order to bring these areas under Christian control. And they forged these very, these very interesting kingdoms that lasted for just under two centuries in the Latin East. And the territories that they conquered 
became known as Outremer, which obviously comes from the French word meaning overseas. And the territories that this encompassed was the Principality of Antioch, which occupies areas of modern, uh, south of modern Turkey and northern Syria, the county of Tripoli, which focuses mainly around modern Lebanon, but the borders aren't quite exact. Then, of course, the county of Edessa, which is, uh, Edessa is now known as Urfa, and it's in southern Turkey, and it's that region. But, of course, the most important of the territories is the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which focuses around the modern states of Israel and the Palestinian territories, all focused on the holy city of Jerusalem, which is sort of the prize that the Crusaders are fighting to conquer and to keep hold of during this time. And of course, as everyone here I'm sure will know, Jerusalem is the center of the three great Abrahamic religions. It has religious centers for Islam, for Judaism, and for Christianity. And so it really was the prize of centuries of endeavor. And to this day, it's a highly disputed and, and fought over territory. And this is, this is where the Crusader states were founded. And in my book, I seek to redress the historical balance because as, the, as our introducer kindly explains, the, the, his, the field of the Crusades is a hyperactive field of study. It's been written about for centuries, um, ever since the time where it's a very, there, it's, there's a rich trove of sources for writing about this period, because even during the Middle Ages, it was exciting. It captured the imaginations of people who were writing. And the result of this is that we have many, many sources explaining it. But what most of these sources have in common is they do overlook the roles played by women in this period. And women really were movers and shakers in the medieval Middle East. The life expectancy for men was shockingly low. A native born king in Jerusalem, in Tripoli, in Antioch and Edessa, that his life expectancy was in his early 20s. Whereas if you compare that to a native born king in France or England, where the average life expectancy is sort of 58 to 60, you see this vast difference. And what this means is that women are able to step into the power vacuum created by the premature deaths of all the male rulers. And that brings about a very interesting phenomenon of female rule in this very unstable region and in this very culturally diverse region. And that's what my book's about. Yeah. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, and you know, this, this aspect of uh, a politically volatile place, uh, bringing out uh, women rulers or women being able to seize power at such a time is very interesting. It happened uh, here as well during the early Mughal rule, you know, when Babur and Humayun were just founding the empire and things were so uncertain. The women were so powerful. Uh, and I wanted to just quote a line because I laughed aloud, and it's not often I do that while reading books on history. Um, and you mentioned how, um, because the men were, were dying so young, aristocratic, uh, aristocratic women sorry, were able to come uh, to power because of their bloodline. And you say they are educated to rule. And this forced society in Outremer to adapt to the concept of queenship and swallow the bitter pill of female rule. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the particular women who seize power at this time and the ones who were really extraordinary in your point of view? Yes, so one of the, one of the early kings of Jerusalem is a man named Baldwin II, who, unlike his predecessors, is a happily married man who waits to have his coronation until his wife and his daughters can join him in Jerusalem. So this in itself indicates that he's going to give his wife and his daughters more respect than perhaps his predecessors have done. And he is blessed with four daughters and no sons. And for this, reason, for this reason, he does make sure that his eldest daughter is recognized as the heir apparent to the throne of Jerusalem from a young age. And her name is Melazon of Jerusalem. And she really is the central figure of my book because not only is she an incredible woman, actually an adjective that you use in your book, Daughters of the Sons, describe one of the Begums is flinty. And I think flinty is a brilliant adjective to describe Melazon as well because she displays this tenacity and this indomitability from such a young age. And her father recognizes her in charters issued by the scriptorium of the Holy Sepulchre and the Chancery of the of, of Kingdom of Jerusalem from a young age as the heiress of the kingdom. So from a young age, we know that she is going to rule. And because she is the, the eldest of four daughters she, and the, the region is so unstable that they, need, they really need to allow her to rule, she is able to succeed to power with, rel with relative ease. And there's a direct comparison to be made to women rulers in Europe at this time, because at the more or less exactly the same time as Melisande is being given this inheritance and will step up to become the first queen regnant of Jerusalem rather than just a consort. She's investing power in her own right. Matilda of England is likewise left power by her father and is unable to succeed to the English throne because the local aristocracy will not accept her on her own as a, as a queen, even though she's married, they will not accept female queenship in the West. 
And so, and a cousin of hers, Stephen, usurps her and England is plunged plunge into a decades long civil war. Whereas in contrast, Melisande is married and accedes to the throne with relative ease. She and her husband and her son inherit together. And it's a curveball when her father decides to leave power to Melisande in her own right, not only as the consort of her husband. So Melisande sets this trend, becoming queen regnant. And her, she ruled, she's one of the longest continuous rulers in the history of the Crusader states. And it's under her, it's under her reign that the, the kingdom of Jerusalem reaches its greatest territorial extent. Her reign also sees the Second Crusade and many, many calamities before Ultramar. So she's ruling at a very difficult time. But, even, but when she dies, the chroniclers, they remember her as a woman of unusual wisdom. So even, even the very misogynistic chroniclers do, do pay her compliments and do recognize her abilities and her legacy. And I think one of the most interesting documents that survives from Melisande's reign, a letter written to her by Bernard Abbott of Clairvaux, who was one of the leading religious figures in the European West at this time. And he he's instrumental in preaching the Second Crusade. And when Melisande's husband dies, which allows her to rule in her own right on her own for many years, he sends her a very remarkable letter in which he says, you must put your hands to strong things and be a man and a woman. You must not shrink from your duty and you must step up to these challenges. And that is, a rem well, well, of course he's saying he, she has to act like a man in order to rule. He is at least showing this confidence that she as a woman has the ability and the right, the authority to wield this power. He's not trying to persuade her to take a new husband and to give power to a man. He's encouraging her to rule in her own right. And that's a remarkable thing in the 12th century. And it really does start this trend of increased, increased possibility for female rule, because for, for generations, women have been given authority in a technical sense. They've been used as political tools, as a way of passing inheritance, continuing bloodlines. They've been technically invested with authority. But how many times these women have actually succeeded in turning authority into tangible power, not just having a title, but, but getting things done, making their voices heard, making decisions? It's hard to glean, but with Melisande, we really do see a turn of the tide, and she does rule in her own right. She resists. She goes head to head with her husband in conflict and comes out on top, and indeed enters into a civil war with her own son in order to keep power. So she's a remarkable woman who really does forge a path for women rulership in the Middle East at this time, which will have reverberations in, across into Europe as well. That's a fascinating story, and you know, for anybody out there who may have doubts, I've never come across a biographer or historian praising a woman for being a ruler as a woman. It's always, well, she was as good as a man, so she was able to rule uh, through the ages and across geographies, I think. Um, so what you were saying about the fact that, uh, you know, her, her husband, Falk of Jerusalem, right? Um, I'm also very interested in how women are able to exhibit anger. And I know at one point you say that she's so angry because I think this aristocratic man, um, Hugh of Jaffa, yes. um, we are not sure was he her lover or not, but they had a very close bond. And when he is ultimately killed, when he dies, her anger is so powerful and overwhelming that folk of Jerusalem is ter terrified of her. So, you know, this yeah. interests me, this anger in a woman, how it can be incendiary and, you know, burn up the world almost. So tell us a little bit about that incident. Well, I think I think that you've touched on two brilliant points there. One is the story of Melazon's relationship with Hugh of Jaffa and her husband, which I'll come to in a second and tell you more about it because it is a brilliant episode. And the other is the presentation of female anger in general. This is something we don't see explored enough in literature even today and acknowledged and recognized that women can be very angry and it's be scared. Uh, yes, <laughs> indeed. But and it's not, and you know, it's always portrayed in, as this unfeminine, this negative thing. But this is, you know, this is ridiculous. And and we, and we see and we see Melisande using her anger as a political tool to propel herself into power very clearly in the chronicles. So what happens is when Melisande does succeed to the throne alongside her husband, her father leaves her and her husband power in equal measure shared with their infant son. This is a curveball. Fulk is not expecting this. He was hoping he'd become king in his own right. And for the first few years of his reign, of their reign, he does try to sideline Melisande. We don't see her signature present in the, in the charters as much as we do later. She seems to be overlooked in matters of government. And then, and Melisande represents the local nobility because Unlike Fulk, who is a European who's come from France, Melisande has been born and bred in the Middle East. She has a, a native Christian mother called Morphe of Melitine, who's Armenian, and then a Crusader father, and she's born and bred in Urfa, in, in the county of Edessa. So she represents the local nobility and the local Christian communities very much. 
And so when the locals of Jerusalem see Melisande being sidelined, obviously they're not happy about this. And this raises rebellion. And the way this is treated in the Chronicles is very, is very interesting. As you point out, we don't know if the leader of this rebellion, her cousin, a man named Hugh of Jaffa, is indeed her lover or not, because the Chronicles do slander Melisande, they slander Hugh, they suggest that this is in fact this rebellion that does happen, this revolt against false authority. They put it down to a marital issue, they put it down to an affair. But there's, there's no evidence for this apart from these rumours. And what's in fact far more likely is that Hugh is challenging Fulk, is challenging Fulk's power, not because of some intrigue, some sort of conjugal intrigue with his wife, but because he objects to the, the foreign European rule in the Council of Uchemer. And this brings Hugh to open rebellion, which eventually leads an assassination attempt, his exile and his death. And Melisande keeps quiet throughout much of this. We don't see her spearheading the rebellion herself. But when Hugh actually dies, then we know, we're told that her fury knows no bounds. And in fact, all supporters of her husband are afraid to even to show their faces in the court of Jerusalem. And they never go anywhere on their own. They're always in groups because they're wide of assassination. And this is when Melisande really comes into her own and asserts, she really converts the authority that she's been given into tangible power by asserting her will. And she rallies people around her. And from this point forward, Fulk will never make a decision without Melisande's consent. Melisande's signature is present on every charter issued from this point they are all they are all issued jointly so laws and grants of land taxation things these are all done with Melisande's approval explicitly from this point forward and in addition we see her fighting to shore up her power base so in addition to ruling in this way she begins to make friends with the Templars the very the very famous military order active at this time and also with the with the church so we see her giving great grants of land to the, to the church but also to the Templars and in addition to this we see her acting as a very generous benefactor to the city of Jerusalem. So any visitors to Jerusalem today will see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Much of the, of the building work that was done that make it the recognizable building it is today was conducted under Melisande's rule and under Melisande's patronage, as well as the covered markets in Jerusalem. She, would, she gave the money to build these markets and took on many other architectural projects, which I'm sure we'll come to in time. But so she really, she, she did a lot to shore up her power base in Jerusalem, and this would serve her in good stead to years to come when her son eventually tries to oust her from power. That's an extraordinary story, really, the way in which, uh, you know, her anger really led to so many of these changes and the establishment of her power. But what I loved about her story was that she had three other sisters, right? Um, and she seemed to sort of look after them for the rest of their lives. She kept an eye out on what was happening, and especially her younger sister, Yvette, it's a very tragic story. So she was, I think, captured at a very young age, returned at about the age of five. A little younger. No, it's even... Not Yvette, even five. Yvette's story is, is awful. I mean, uh, so this is Baldwin II of Jerusalem is taken prisoner and held in, in, he's held in a fortress called Carpat. And eventually they managed to negotiate a ransom. But in these days, it's not as quick as a bank transfer or a gym bag full of hundred dollar bills. You can't just hand the money over. It's assembling treasure in chests and transporting it across hostile territory. And in addition to a ransom of gold, there's, the, there's lands that need to be transferred. They request certain territories to be given up. And he's held by an emir called Timotash who wants certain lands in the region of Antioch and an awful lot of gold dinars. So it takes a while to raise the ransom. And as surety for this ransom, as sort of the down payment, in order to secure his release, Baldwin gives his two-year-old daughter as a hostage to the Islamic court, to Timotash, to hold her as surety of this debt being repaid. And it goes all right for Baldwin. I mean, he plays Russian roulette with his daughter's life. He doesn't honour the treaty that he promised to, and Timotash would have been well within his right to kill the daughter, but he doesn't. And she is eventually returned to her family. But having spent a year in captivity, she is at this point considered sort of damaged goods. She's considered tainted. And the language in the Chronicles is unclear. They say she's been tainted by her time in captivity. And some historians have taken that to mean she was sexually abused. I don't think this is the case. I think it's highly unlikely. She, she would have been a very honored prisoner. She would have been kept very safe. Um, but in any case, after this association being tainted by this time in captivity, she cannot make a good marriage. And as we know, there aren't many options for women apart from marriage in the medieval world. The only other honourable career path open to her is to become is to become a nun. And this is, I think, what you're referring to because Melisande does look after her sister. They originally she goes to a convent in Jerusalem, the, the convent of Saint Anne, which still stands and is, I think, one of the most beautiful examples of medieval architecture in Jerusalem. But this Melisande doesn't think is quite exalted enough for her younger sister, and instead she goes and she builds 
a brand new convent called the Convent of Bethany um, from scratch and fortifies it with many watchtowers and endows it with much gold and installs her sister, not originally as abbess, but as, as a senior nun who will then become abbess. And Yvette actually in this position wields as much power as her secular sisters because the Convent of Bethany is one of the most important religious orders in the Latin states at this time, it's incredibly wealthy. And Yvette will also go on to play a key role in educating the future rulers of Jerusalem because aristocratic women, when, when their mothers, their, when marriages fall apart, as does happen, are sent to this convent to be educated. So Yvette plays a, a role in the education of Sibylla of Jerusalem, who will eventually defend Jerusalem against Saladin. So for all of this, Smellers on does ensure that her, her, her sister's futures are accounted for, with the notable exception, of course, of Alice. But Poor Alice. We have to talk about Alice as well, because in many ways, it seems like if things had turned out differently, we would be talking about Alice of Antioch today rather than Melisande, right? They, they were also just circumstances which didn't work in her favor. So can you tell us a little bit about how, you know, whatever she did, somehow it didn't seem to work out for her? Yeah, so Alice is Melisande's second sister, who actually marries before Melisande does. She's married at the age of, I think, 16 to the, to the Prince of Antioch, and she becomes the Princess of Antioch. And for the first few years, she is in, she's there in a princess consort role. She's the wife of the ruler. She gives birth to a daughter called Constance, who will come to soon. But soon she will, when her husband is killed in battle, as happens very frequently, Alice then tries to take control of the Principality of Antioch. And she tries three times to claim, to claim the rule of the city of Antioch. She wants to claim agency and to wield power in her own right. And she's damned by historians for this. Even to the modern day, modern historians whose work I love and I respect them, you know, they're far more talented than I am. They, they still insist on viewing Alice through this gendered lens that is originally set up by the medieval chroniclers. So William of Tyre is the main source for history of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. And he is a, he's a brilliant historian. He, he's ahead of his time. He intersperses sort of first person interviews with local people with big picture analysis of historical trends and events. And he predicts the fall of Jerusalem a few years before it happens. So he is brilliant, but he, he, he's a perfect example of a historian who will cast women in one of two camps because he is a champion of Melisande. It's he who writes that Melisande was a woman of unusual wisdom and equal to any man of her generation. Whereas, you know, with the same, the same pen, the same parchment, he writes that Alice was extremely wicked and was convinced by evil spirits that entered into her brain to rebel against her husband and her father. She couldn't possibly have had political ambitions of her own. She couldn't possibly, for him, have been an intelligent woman who wanted to claim her birthright, to claim power, much as the men who she was educated alongside would have done. No, for him, she must have been tricked by evil spirits, by magic, by witchcraft into these rebellions. And so she's damned by historians. Then, through, through down the centuries, she's criticized and she's never never considered as an active political agent, only as a troublemaker and only as strongly misguided. That said, Alice is, does not play her cards well when she comes to her rebellions and all are unsuccessful eventually. She, in each case, she manages to take control of the city, but only for a short amount of time. And she's quite creative. You know, she tries to forge alliances with local Muslim rulers to bring her the forces, the armies that she needs to hold Antioch. But in doing so, this loses her the sympathy of, the Christ, of her Christian allies who don't want to ally with Islamic forces. And then her final rebellion is quite, it's kind of tragic. Um, she's managing to hold the city. And then a, a, a man arrives at the gates, a powerful magnate from France, the Raymond of Poitiers. And he suggests to her, why don't, why don't you let me in? And why don't we get married? And then with my support, we can rule Antioch together. And don't worry, I'll, I'll give you a good amount of power. And Alice, you know, she's in quite a difficult position at this point. And so she thinks maybe this will work. Maybe it's a good plan. So she opens the gates to the city and lets Raymond in and goes to start getting prepared for her wedding. Maybe she's ordering a dress. Maybe she's ordering a feast, whatever it is she might be doing. And while she's making the preparations for her wedding, Raymond kidnaps her eight-year-old daughter and marries her instead. And this ousts Alice from the line of succession because now her daughter married to this powerful French lord is a much stronger, has a much stronger claim to power than Alice does herself. And so Alice from this point is exiled and she disappears from the historical record. It's likely she dies a few years after this. And from this point forward, we don't hear of her. So we don't, this is where her relationship with Melisande ends. But even when Alice is rebelling against Fulk, Melisande's husband, against Baldwin, their father, Melisande does have Alice's back. She does persuade forgiveness for her sister. So even when Alice, these rebellions, these acts of treason are foiled, she never is dispossessed of her lands. She's never... 
you know, she's never imprisoned. She's never truly exiled. She's allowed to keep her fortress at Latakia and she retires there. But yeah. Poor Alice. You have to feel bad for her. Stabbed in the back by a potential fiancé with her own daughter. Really. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you brought up a point which was very interesting to me. You said that even recent historians have uh, variously called uh, Alice flighty, meddlesome, and silly. You know, these are familiar words yeah. in, in, in which women are described. Um, but you do have the account of William of Tyre, which was so crucial, I'm sure, for your work, for your ability to write this book. Uh, and sometimes it's these um, lucky happenstances that we come across the voices of women. Uh, you know, when I was writing one of my books, uh, who uh, I wrote about a woman who lived at the time of the Buddha. And it's because the Buddha is the first heavily documented man in India that we do accidentally have the stories of few of the nuns, the women. So apart from William of Tyre, did you have other sources that you were able to explore because this was a time of great, uh, uh, you know, ebullion and volatility and interest for the Western world that was being written about. So did you have other interesting nuggets of information that you were able to bring out? Yeah, so there, there are many, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's a rich trove of sources for this period and region. We have we have material culture. So from Elizondes, in fact, one of the most interesting pieces of evidence we have for her reign, her position and her cultural identity is her personal prayer book, the Melaton Psalter, which was made for her by her husband as a peace offering following the incident with Hugh of Jaffa when she was very angry. Pres presents were rain rained down upon her, I think, as a way of making peace. And one of them is this beautiful prayer book, which has influences from many different cultures. So there are Armenian elements to the design, Arabic, European, Byzantine, all these different elements are combined. And so it's, it's really, is, uh, give this, in this one object, we have a real glimpse of what, the identity was in medieval Jerusalem but in addition we do have many written sources in across many different languages we have Arabic sources we have Armenian sources Syriac sources Latin French we have so much is written about it but all of them they do miss out the women to a larger or greater to a lesser or greater degree and this was this was the, the key part of my research was to go through these sources some in translation some in the original with a fine-tooth comb looking for any reference to the women and then to try and peel back the value judgments imposed upon the women by the medieval chroniclers. So you're right, we do we have descriptions of Alice as silly, as wicked, as flighty, as meddlesome. These are not words that are applied to male rulers. And and I have to say, again, it does need stressing, none of these people, while a lot of them are admirable and we can get excited about their life stories, none of them are very nice people. So we're not we're not looking to make heroines out of these women. You know, they're part of a very problematic movement of oppression in the Middle East. But if you're going to study the Crusades, you need to look at the roles of the women as well. And when the historians are writing about the men, they, do, they don't use this language about them. And the women, are, they are always portrayed through this very gendered lens. And if a woman does, like Melison, does rule well, does succeed to power, they're treated as an anomaly. But the point is, is that actually, if you, if you pull, peel back all these layers of dismissal and overlooking the women, you can actually see that women are ruling far more than you think they would. Melisande is not an exception in her time. Her sister Hodiana of Tripoli rules as the sole ruler of Tripoli for several years, and she's a successful ruler at this time. As we said, Yvette has a successful career in the Abbey of Bethany. But it's not only in the Crusader courts, it's not only in the Christian world. Across the borders of the court of Damascus, we have Islamic women also wielding power. Now, here we come to a crucial difference. They are not invested with authority in the same way. Melisande is an anointed queen who is recognized with political authority in her own right, in her own right, the right to rule. In Damascus, we don't see women being given the official right to rule, but we see them wielding as much power as in Jerusalem. And this was shocking. I mean, when I wrote my, when I was writing my book, women like Zamara de Damascus and Saladin's wife, Ismatadine Khatun, who, whose first name we don't know, they didn't have, you know, it's not a great basis of fame, but they didn't have Wikipedia pages. You know, there's, they're completely overlook no one thinks about them but they're incredibly powerful women and Samara of Damascus as I've said she's not invested with authority in her own right but she's the wife of one ruler of Damascus Bori of Damascus and the mother of three subsequent rulers and forges her own political alliance with the Atabeg of Aleppo Zengi which which leads to an incredible shift in power in the east at this time and like Melison, she undertakes architectural patronage and this is another type of source that we have to look at we have the Madrasa Hatuniya still standing in Damascus, which was the product of Zamarad's patronage, just as we have the buildings in Jerusalem that were the products of Melison's patronage. And on top of this, you know, in the Islamic sources, it's attested that Saladin was exchanging daily letters with his wife. And yes, she's one of many wives, but 
she's in an esteemed position and you don't write daily letters to an uneducated woman who is just a sexual object to you or just just a, a brood mare for your sons you don't have that sort of relate that so we see that these women are educated that they are playing an important role they're perhaps wielding influence over their husbands and Ismatuddin Khatun is married not only to Saladin but his predecessor Nur ad-Din so she's married to the two most influential Muslim warlords of the age and she's completely overlooked in the chronicles we don't even have her name so the sources are there but you have to you have to pick up fleeting references and extrapolate from them and then cross reference them with the material culture and what and the, the dropped references the scattered references and sources of other languages in order to construct a picture of who these women were, how they were using their power, and indeed how much power they truly had. And I found it interesting that Zumarud invested not in a, you know, in a religious structure, not in a tomb or a mosque, but the madrasa, a place of education. So, you know, it does tell us a little bit more about if you want to think closely about the sort of things she did. Um, but very interesting about the way you were, you know, the, what you say about the orientalizing of women that happens across the world in our sources. Uh, you know, the Europeans, the way in which they wrote about Mughal women here was exactly the same. They were completely uh, debased as far as the European writers were concerned. And actually, they were uh, so much more. Uh, I also liked the way in which you were able to tease out very small details, like you tell us about what Melisande might have looked like uh, by seeing what uh, uh, writers and historians have described her sons as looking at and I it's something yeah. you know I, I do as well so this is fascinating the way in, the way in which you write histories of women that's that's exactly it the only Melisande the most important woman of the crusader period by a long shot in in her region that is and no the, the chronicles at this time they follow this trend of of iconismus and this very detailed type of description of what people look like so with with individual men we have whole pages detailing the mo most minute aspects of their appearance. You know, we know that Baldwin's hair was long and gray in later life. We know that his knees were callous from prayer. We know that Raymond of Tripoli had flashing eyes and a hooked nose. We have so much detail. But Melisande, all we have of her appearance is a description of her son, in which they say he was rather tall and spare. And in this respect, he resembled his mother. So all we can really glean of Melisande's appearance is that she was quite thin, maybe quite tall, th things like this. But it's so little, they're just, they're just overlooked. And I think this is another, this is an interesting thing that perhaps we don't discuss often enough, which is just as the sources are written by, most of the medieval Christian sources are written by churchmen who don't interact with women very much in their daily lives. And so for this reason, they may not actually be given the most accurate presentation of the roles that women filled in society because that they're not first-hand witnesses to it and they don't, they're not, it's not their comfort zone to talk about the roles of women. So the majority of sources we have about the roles women were playing in society are written by people who were not well informed on these, who are not you know, as necessarily active in palace intrigue as they might have been or as they would present themselves. So even, even the medieval chronicles that we have, it's unclear how well placed the clerics were to be writing about women's role in palace life. Correct, and what sort of prejudice they had in tainting their writings as well. But William of Tyre is an important person that you have been able to consult. It's, it's wonderful for a writer to find. Um, and I believe he was writing at, at some point, though he was training to be a clergyman, he was a clergyman and said to be, uh, you know, uh, said to have a great career. Um, but he ended up narrating stories to the king, is that right? And yes. I was wondering, is that why he sort of made it very interesting to keep the king's interest and why his writings are not as dire as they might have been? Yes, I think, you know, so William, William's a really interesting historian because, and he's very, he is very well placed to write about the Crusader course of the Latin East because he's born and raised in Jerusalem. So he start his early education is at the Cathedral School of the Holy Sepulchre. And then following that, he's educated in Europe. He serves for a time as an ambassador to Constantinople. Um, he then becomes the deacon of Tyre, a very important city now on the Lebanese coast. And then he's asked to become the court historian by King Amalric, who's Melisande's son. So this, of course, does influence to what extent he will praise Melisande in his chronicles because he's right, you know, his, his audience is, is first and foremost her son and the royal court. But that doesn't stop him savaging the king's aunts. So we hope that there's some degree of, of evidence in it. And, you know, he, he makes very clear throughout that he's, he's, he's doing his best to, to be accurate. And, he, you know, he does, he does really lambast some very important political figures. So he doesn't hold back when he really has a grudge against somebody. Um, but... But yes, he fulfills this role as the court historian, but where William is perhaps most interesting is that he, 
also serves as the tutor to the future king of Jerusalem, Baldwin IV. And he's still, he's still a practicing clergyman at this time, but he is also entrusted with the education of the future king of Jerusalem. And perhaps the most interesting personal episode in William's Chronicle is when he diagnoses the king's son with leprosy. Um, this is Baldwin IV, who comes known sort of popularly as the leper king of Jerusalem. And this is, and it's Baldwin IV's leprosy that really begin, is the beginning of the end for the kingdom of Jerusalem because it completely destabilizes the succession. He will never be able to rule. And his older sister, Sibylla, is suddenly forced into the limelight. She suddenly becomes the heir of Jerusalem. But unlike Melazon, she's not been, she's been raised at the convent of Bethany alongside Yvette, but she hasn't been attending meetings of the high council since her childhood. So she's perhaps less, less equipped to rule and things go downhill from this point. Um, but this actually, the discussion of Sibylla and Baldwin IV in conjunction with what we've discussed already brings us to the issue of Orientalism and sexualization of women in the historical sources and in popular narrative, because one of the most famous films, examples of uh, the Crusades and modern culture is the Ridley Scott film, Kingdom of Heaven, which portrays the collapse of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the period where my book ends, where my book finishes with the fall of Jerusalem to Saladin. And it's here, you know, we have, we have Eva Green playing Queen Sibylla, and she's wearing all these clothes that's ridiculous that she would ever have conceived of wearing. The costumes are fully orientalized. They try to make her into this exotic and highly sexual figure, having a fat, like, you know, all of these things, which we have no evidence for. So if, if anything, the storyline is more accurate for Melisande, but it's certainly not accurate for Sibylla. And all portrayals of Crusader Queens are in, in medieval chronicles. They become, they become the focus of med the medieval romance genre in many respects. So Hodierna of Tripoli, Melisande's sister, who's this incredibly powerful ruler. She's remembered in literature chiefly as the distant sexual fantasy of a troubadour, a French man who sits in France fantasizing about Hodierna of Tripoli. And that's a huge part of how she's remembered in her legacy. Um, and it's the same with Eleanor of Aquitaine, the French queen who goes on crusades. Again, a very famous Western portrayal of her in film is Catherine Hepburn playing her in The Lion of Winter, where she famously makes the declaration, I rode bare-breasted halfway to Damascus. These are these images of crusader queens and women of this period as highly sexualized, quite subversive and very orientalized women. We see, you know, Christian queens dressed in Islamic armor. It would never have happened. And I think this is very true of how Western sources portray women in Mughal India as well, as well as women in the Ottoman Empire and everywhere. They're always seen through this, this lens of, this twin lens of orientalism and intense sexualization and yeah. And the love interest. There's always a love interest for a woman, right? Um, I think before we go over to uh, some questions, sure. I just quickly wanted to ask you about this interesting uh, custom that uh, they had at this time, which I kind of found a parallel in, you know, you know, in our system in the epics is the system of being offered three suitors to marry, yeah. you know, and it would seem like, okay, that gives them a lot of choice. And if, for those of you who know the epics, we had a system called the Swayamvar, where a woman was allowed to choose apparently a groom from amongst a collection of men. But actually, if you look at it closely, those men were vetted by the father very closely. And they were often old, much older men who had power, but were not particularly romantic ideals for the young girls marrying. So can you tell us a little bit about the system of having just these three suitors to choose from? Yeah, so um, under the Concordat of Nablus, where a lot of rules were agreed by men about how women should behave, um, one of them was the provision for widows. So aristocratic widows were obliged to remarry. They had a year of mourning, and then if their liege lords, you know, their immediate male relative superior, demands that they were legally required to remarry. However, they were given a choice of three suitors. And where we encounter this in my book is in the case of Alice's daughter, who is kidnapped at the age of eight and married to Raymond of Poitiers. He will eventually be killed in battle, as per usual. And she is then asked to remarry. But Const and she's offered these three suitors who are very carefully vetted and none of them appeal to her. And Constance is quite, quite clever here because, and again, this is because the political instability in the region coming together to give the women more freedom. Because, because her immediate male relative, her cousin, the King of Jerusalem, has his hands full with, with battle, actually, his, his primary concern is not marrying his cousin. And because of the geographical distance and the lack of manpower and the difficulty of the chain of command, Constance actually manages to dodge choosing any of these, these three suitors. And she manages to put off marriage even further by sending envoys on a long journey to Constantinople to get a recommendation from the Byzantine Empire, who then sends her another suitor to choose from she waits for him to make the long journey to Antioch 
toys with the idea for a few months and then sends him packing again. And apparently he's so upset he becomes a monk sort of thing. She's a heartbreaker. <laughs> but she manages to fend off these suitors for such a long time and eventually chooses her own husband. And a man she was completely, it was completely unexpected for her to marry. And again, the instability forces the king to accept her choice of husband because they cannot, Constance is sort of in quite a powerful position. She's the heiress to Antioch and she goes behind everyone's back and she, by all accounts, she does have a love affair with this mercenary soldier in the pay of the king, Reynard de Chatillon, who becomes a very infamous figure, a very brutal crusader. Um, and the king in the West, perhaps in a more stable environment, might have disgraced the princess. She might have been sent to a convent. She might have been punished. She might have been disinherited. But they can't do that because Antioch is this frontier state that needs, that needs the legitimacy of the dynasty that Constance represents. And so the king is forced, in fact, to instead of forcing one of three suitors upon her, he's forced to accept her choice of Reynard de Chatillon. So she actually manages to wield quite a lot of agency over her own destiny there. Whether or not she makes a good choice, that's open for debate. I, you know, and this is and this is the thing, these women are not necessarily role models. They're not perfect people. And you know, as historians, it's not our job to make sort of, you know, to pretend that these women were better than they were, but it's to show them as they actually were, which is flawed individuals, but intelligent, active and ambitious individuals nonetheless. Well, thank you, Catherine. I think Constance of Antioch is as good a place to stop this discussion as any. And we just have a few minutes for questions. If anyone in the audience uh, wants to know anything further from uh, Catherine about this wonderful, wonderful book. There's a lady there in the middle at the back. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you just talked about like, sexualizing women. And so there is a like two sides of gender. One is that they make them very incompetent. And one is that they romanticize them so much and they make it like, like they over-sexualize them and kind of like kind of erase the part of what they have done and just create a fantasy of them. So how do you navigate that uh, as a writer, as a historian? And how, like, how do we see these women as what they might have done? It was a brilliant question. And actually, I wrote my undergraduate dissertation on exactly this dichotomy between not only reducing women to objects, but extolling them and putting them on pedestals. And actually, to put a woman on a pedestal is as much to dehumanize her as to tread her underfoot and make her into an object. Um, in, in the medieval chronicles, we don't have so much of a problem of this. They, they don't idealize the women, with the exception of Melisande, to William of Tyre is effusive in his praise about. And so I did, this wasn't a problem I really had to navigate because Melisande, in addition to William's praise of her, we do have the written evidence, we do have the charter evidence, we do have the archaeological evidence that shows that Melisande was in fact a very powerful woman. Now, as, as we've actually just touched upon, it would be a mistake, I think, to call Melisande a heroine. You know, she was part of a deeply flawed movement. And so William's chronicle does extol her. It does put her on a pedestal as the model woman, as you know, a woman of unusual wisdom. But I think what my, I'm trying to do with my book and the discussions like these is to show that Melisande wasn't hugely unusual. She had more opportunities to rule and to wield power, but she wasn't one in a million. She was, she was an intelligent woman who was given more opportunities to demonstrate that to us, I think. But we do, we do have, with, with her, we do have other evidence to back up that she was, she was wielding power and making interesting decisions in her time, yeah. Thank you. Another question in the front here. Hi, two Hi. questions. One is what triggered you to study this particular issue in the first place? What gave you the interest in this period and in the women? I mean, you touched on it in the beginning, but what was your journey? The second is a question of what language was spoken in the, these kingdoms and ethnically what happened after the collapse of the kingdoms? Did the French just stay on? Did they move back? This what happened? I've always wondered about that. It's so interesting. So I'll start with the first question. And it, it's a, essentially, I, you know, the Crusades are on the UK school curriculum. And so I encountered this, this time period at A-level. And I was frustrated at the time because we mentioned Melisande of Jerusalem, mentioned Alice of Antioch. But, you know, when you come to an exam, there's never an essay question on them. So we didn't study them very much. And there was nothing written about them. There was one very important essay at this time. I was studying in 2012, my A-levels, but you know, there was one, but it was an academic essay. It was very jargony, it was very inaccessible. And at the time I didn't think very much about it, but when I finished my master's degree and I looked and there still wasn't a book about these women and they're churning out new books in the crusades every year. 
and there's still nothing on the woman. I thought, right, I want to fix this. You know, I want to give this woman, these women their due in the history. And regarding the ethnic diversity in the language, it's a brilliant question. Um, so regarding the language, there is evidence of a lingua franca in the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean basin at this time, which is sort of, it's hard, I couldn't tell you exactly what the elements are, but it incorporates elements of Italian and French and Greek. Um, and I think, you know, maybe a, something that might be similar in the modern day is Maltese, which is a, a language with strong Arabic influence. But in the Crusader states, really, I think the people spoke the language, spoke many different languages. So I live in Lebanon now and the people, you know, the population there, they are, most of them are fluent in at least Arabic and either French or English. So you do have a multilingual society and, and, that, and, and it depends where the leaders came from. So Provençal, the dialect of Southern France would have been strong in the medieval Middle East, but so would so would Greek have been. Um, Latin was the scholarly language. So there are many different language, languages flying around, but in addition, the local dialects of Syriac and Armenian would have been prevalent in those communities. So there are many different languages coexisting. Following the fall of Jerusalem, yes, I mean, the Europeans are largely driven from the land, but in terms of the ethnic makeup, they stay there. You have a lot of, you have, that you have blue-eyed Palestinians, blue-eyed Syrians, that, and because many, while a lot of Christians did manage to escape or to, you know, evacuate, um, many more were sold as slaves um, into the slave markets of Aleppo. And they went into the harems of, of rulers. They became wives. They became all these things. So the genetic diversity remains in that region, even if as a sort of a political entity, the, the Franks were left. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we have time for this oh. afternoon. Well, is there, can we take a last question? Do we have five minutes? No, no, okay, no. You can come and meet the author afterwards, get the book signed, go and buy the book. It's a great book, please do buy it. Thank you so thank much, you Catherine. So much. Thank you. We would like to thank Catherine Pangonis and Ida Mukoti.